Um, topic for today is uh, customer segmentation and clustering problems. So first of all, what's customer segmentation and why do we do that? Okay, excuse me, guys. I need to turn this off. And so why do we do this customer segmentation? Well, typically within the business settings, you would like to uh, separate customers in the groups. And that you do that uh, in order to uh, provide you know, additional services or specialized services for each of the group. Um, that typically done uh, based on some properties, based on some customer properties. And here I'll show on this slide, I'm showing you some main basis for the segmentation. Um, there are several main ideas. So first of all, you can actually look at the geographic information, right? Um, things like, you know, customer location or maybe a region or, or, or any other classification. Then, of course, um, various demographic demographics, like, for example, age, gender, occupation. Then we can have a behavioral um, which is, uh, you know, the way you, for example, the way the customer is is behaving, you know, either on the site or with their purchases. Um, and then there is also uh, potentially like psychographic information, which refers to, you know, lifestyles or maybe, you know, some personality traits if um, they can be calculated. So why do you want to segment customers? Well, there, there are several reasons, right? So first of all, um, custom segmentation is it's a marketing tool. Um, if you want to provide some sort of marketing or service differentiation for the customers. So for example, improve marketing focus because different customers, different segments of customers will have different interests, will have different tastes, uh, reasons for purchasing. And so you want to provide um, targeted uh, message, right? Targeted advertising to a particular group. And so you want to segment the group. Um, you might want to actually find out the most and least profitable customers and uh, act, you know, correspond respondingly to, to, to whether they, they make a lot of revenue for you. Um, also, you want to build loyal relationship with those customers that are profitable for you. Um, and, and, possibly create persona, personas for simulations. Well, this is like sort of representative customer. Um, then there is the, the other side of marketing, which is actually branding and, and specialized products that can be uh, designed for segments. And brand also appeals to different segments very differently. And finally, um, very important is pricing because different segments usually have different um uh, you know tolerance to price change and have different um ability to 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 purchase things um so you can have a differential pricing depending on what kind of uh segment is for example airlines can price the seats on the same flight the same type of seats differently for different categories like last minute buyer versus business buyer versus sort of leisurely buyer. Um, there is also well known that online services experimenting with this type of segmentation when um, the price, for example, also for those for like, you know, restaurant uh, for um, hotels or um, airlines, whether depending depends on whether you access the website from the Mac or from PC, right? And the assumption that people that that people from Mac they actually willing to pay more for for the service for the same type of service. So, bottom line, uh, segmentation is not just uh, done not just for for the sort of for the sake of the interest of what kind of customers we have, but it is um, actually a very useful tool. Um, use daily in practice. So what kind of metrics do we have to do the segmentation? Well, um, 
there is sort of standard and in in, in uh, marketing the standard approach is so-called RFM um, behavioral segmentation which stands for recency frequency and monetary right so recency it it is sort of the freshness of the customer activity um, when the customer uh, made the last purchase uh, frequency how often customer makes purchases and finally monetary reward is actually how much money on average uh, customer spends so the, so the spending power and then for every customer you can literally compute from the data that is available those three metrics so you, you your customer becomes you know this point in the three-dimensional space And you know you you can probably take um, you know segments and and visualize. Let's say, for example, here is an example of uh, customers for a service where uh, you look. It's it's sort of the, the visualization showing a frequency versus um, recency score, um, and uh, each block is proportional to the number of customers with that score. And here, uh, you, the the sort of regions, right, which is a uh, customer cohorts, custom groups, they also uh, label differently. Like for example, you know, if somebody is, uh, uh, you know, just sort of new, for example, you know, it, it is on the very right and frequency, um, how frequently the purchases are, um, and. For example, you can notice this segment of very important can lose customers, which is very high frequency and 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 very recent, right? Versus um, some loyal customers and 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 champions, right? Those who uh, purchase you know, often and a lot. But what you might observe on this slide also is that those boundaries there sort of determined a bit arbitrarily so with 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 uh, you know borders uh placed there by um marketeers right so can we do better than that well you can actually try to look at the histograms right and so you might want to try to find natural boundaries um that would be presented by histograms but then it will be what's called univariate analysis. So, for example, if you look at gender, of course, okay, female versus male, that's very easy. But if you look at the annual income, well, there is this continuous histogram. You still have the question of like, okay, how are we going to split it? Do we split, uh, you know, do, do, we, do, do we split, uh, you know, at 40, at 60, at 80? or do we split into two or three i don't know right so this is a um the the histogram can be helpful but cannot answer all the questions now we can plot this in multi-dimensional space and and if and each point is a customer and on the axis we do have uh age annual income and and ending score just sort of renormalized to, to to see them here uh, and so it's not very clear where to place the boundaries right in between customers how to draw the lines and especially it's, it's 3d if you have three parameters but now think about that we can have not only three parameters but many more and so the way to do this is autom automatically is by clustering clustering really means is finding groups of nodes that are more closer to each other than with than to the rest and this technique is unsupervised meaning that we do not have labels like with the supervised learning we let algorithm do this itself by itself and we just sort of accept the result now there are a few things of course you need to know to do clustering but the overall idea is is that it is uh, happening unsupervised fashion so um, no target variable and the goal for the clustering um, to discover patterns in the data to see what patterns we, we, we might find in the data and if you look at this slide um, you see like for example three groups right 
if this was a question of customer segmentation, then we would probably say like, okay, these are three cl clusters, um, three groups of customers. And so that's the type of segmentation we do, right? We're not going to be doing like sort of fixed uh, boundaries. We'll try to uh, automatically find the boundaries in between groups of most similar customers. And then as at the end, when we do segmentation, segmentation is done, every customer would be typically assigned to one cluster. Now, it can actually be assigned to several clusters with different probabilities, but more often, customer is being assigned to a cluster. And there exist multiple clustering algorithms. The examples are k-means, hierarchical clustering, spectral clustering, Gaussian, and, and many more. So let's talk about a few of them. So first of all, uh, before we go into the algorithm itself, we need to define <clears throat> the metric that, that tells about the sort of similarity between points, right? So how close points are, because that's what we want to, to, to detect. And let's say if we have um, numerical attributes, then we can introduce Euclidean distance, um, just simply Euclidean distance in, in, in as many dimensions as we want to. You can introduce Manhattan distance, or you can think about Pearson correlation coefficient. Um, and Pearson correlation coefficient is, is quite similar to cosine similarity, where you're looking at the data points as vectors and looking for an angle between them. Um, attributes, when they're uh, categorical, um, you can deal with them converting with one hot encoding, which is zero or one, or there are other methods to handle you know, the, the categorical attributes. So let's focus right now on numerical attributes to make life easier. Um, and this is a k-means clustering. Now, k-means clustering is probably the most you know, famous algorithm and, and the most um, hardworking algorithm um, within, within the data science. Um, so the idea is, is, is the following, that we need to initially, we need to assume some number of clusters. And that is the input that comes into algorithm from, from, a, uh, yeah, from, from, from a human, right? From data scientist. Um, we need to decide how many clusters we want to, to detect. Now, depending on uh, the result, we'll see if our guess was correct or, or incorrect. But at the beginning, we'll just make an assumption. Now here we'll make a, like a guess that there are three clusters, um, but you know we'll see how it works. So assuming that there are three clusters, the algorithm is is very straightforward. Um, you assign randomly every point to to a cluster, right? You just say, okay, you know, pick up, uh, you know, for every point, like randomly pick up what cluster is going to belong to, and then. For each of the three groups, and three groups here because there are three classes, three classes, or three clusters we're trying to find, we calculate the centroid of that group. And then we measure the distance in between each, in between each point and the centroid, measure the distance, and reassign points to the closest centroid. We then recompute the centroids. And here on like pretty much third or fourth iteration, you see that centroids um, ended up within you know, each of the clusters. And you know that's you do this until centroids uh, will not move anymore. So it's a iterative algorithm um, that uh, built to minimize the distances within um, within cluster distances in Euclidean space. And uh, it actually works really, really well. But it, to make it work, you need to give it the number of clusters. So the question is, of course, how many clusters to, to give to the algorithm? So the idea here is you actually, you know, of course you have some assumption of you know, how many groups you want, but then you can actually go through some number of groups and make algorithm, you know, do the clustering for each proposed number of clusters, like what's shown here, k equal to two, k equal to three, k equal to four. So you split into two clusters, three, three and four clusters. And then for each cluster, you can actually calculate 
the intercluster distance. So you sum up all the distances from all the points to the to the center of the cluster. And by doing so, you actually uh, you know calculating sort of the tightness of of the of the group. And so then the method is, okay, let's just measure this tightness uh, as a function of number of clusters. And then there is this method which is called, you know, elbow method, which is, okay, you look at this curve that you get and you pick up this point where it bends the most, right? Sort of, you know, the second, um, the second derivative point, right? So it's elbow. Um, so that's how you determine the number of clusters you do. So you kind of, you know, make an assumption, you can go look, look around, try different numbers, and then, you know, build this uh, curve, and that will give you sort of the optimal one. Another approach that is also very widely used is called agglomerative clustering. So in, in this approach, we're actually building clusters bottom up. And as a result, you'll have a tree structure. So the way to do this is you literally search, search through all the data points that are out there and finding the one that is closest to each other. And you put them in a cluster. Then you look for another pair of points and finding those that are closest to each other. And uh, you know that's your another seed of the cluster. Then you start looking for yet more points and the distance between those points and the seed and this those seed clusters. You find out, and um, you you will select the smallest one and join that cluster. And that's how you build step by step iteratively. Uh, this hierarchy of of um, you know the tree uh, of the of the clusters. Um, also, a very very popular method. It's quite expensive because you need to com keep computing the distances. Um, so you it, it's going to be hard to use this on a very large data set. But on a small one, it actually works pretty well. And especially when you get the tree. You can actually take that tree and always disassemble it on the certain number of clusters you want. And to measure the distance between clusters, you, again, you can use Euclidean space and you can use the same distances um, as we discussed uh, before. Now, another method, which is actually probably one of the most powerful among, among this, is uh, dbscan. Um, the idea is that instead of actually looking at the points, we're trying to um, calculate the density function, so the, the the density of the points, assume density of the points, right? Because we you know we don't have a um, you know real density function, so we're going to interpolate, right? And but then the method is quite similar. So we'll select a random point, and we select radius, and uh, you know, we, we actually take this radius and see if we have any points, you know, starting with this core point, if we can see, if we see any points within that radius, right, within that epsilon um, of the central point. And if we do, we join them to, we join them the first point, you know, forming a cluster. And then you actually relocating your sort of centroid onto this new point and see if you can capture other points and so on and so forth and uh until you and until you sort of you know done and then you if there are if not all the points are, are were reached then you starting with with a new point that's left out and based on that uh, based on how many points you get into the circles, you actually calculate, you know, the density function, sort of um, the, the the density of the points within that circle, and then you use this density with the level set, which means you select particular uh, height. You can think about like sort of this as an, on the image here, sort of mountains, and then you kind of filling filling the valley with water, and um, you know, at some at some level, it separates and. Here you have you know two clusters um, that that we get, and there exist many more methods um, that that allows us to do clustering. Now, here on this slide you see the 
example, the, the comparison of those methods. Um, you, you know, we talked right now about uh, several. We talked about agglomerative clustering, which is this uh, central central method. Let me turn on the. Uh oh. Okay, so we uh, we looked at the agglomerative clustering at this one, and um, to understand why it does this. And then we looked at the DB scan at this cluster. Um, and then uh, where is k-means? And here is a k-means cluster, the first one we, we talked about. So we have k-means, we have db scan and agglomerate. We looked at those. And notice that k-means, for example, here, it's, it's sort of very clear that what you want to do is you want to be able to detect those uh, you know, circles as separate clusters. Um, you know, there is this groups, that groups, et cetera. So if you look at um, k-means, you know, it did a very good job, of course, when you have those three separate uh, groups of nodes, um, then it works just fine. You're not bad when those groups are also quite close together. But but whatever reason, it decided, of course, because we forced it to be, you know, three clusters. It actually, even there is no three clusters in the data, it will find three clusters, and it makes mistakes here. If you look at agglomerative, it actually does pretty well uh, right here, right there, right there. Um, you know, it makes some mistake here because you would expect those three groups be differently colored. Some strange thing, but other than that, agglomerative actually worked better than Achaemians. And Dibiscan actually did really good at those tests, right? So it completely correctly predicted all the all the clusters. So in this sense, dbscan is probably the best method, um, you know, for the job. Okay, so that's pretty much all I wanted to show and to tell you about the clustering. Um, let's discuss another topic, which is actually quite similar. It is also um, topic of unsupervised learning. Um, which is, uh, but in this in this case, we're gonna we're gonna talk about um, dimensionality reduction, and that is a very very important topic um, because you know we use it literally all, all the time. We use it for different purposes, um, you know, from from visualization, from data visualization, to um, actually of, um, the finding. Uh, finding uh, and, and reducing dimensionality, finding sort of better um, representation for our data points um, to build the machine learning models on. But overall, my, overall dimensionality reduction is you know transformation of data from one high dimensional space into the space of lower dimensionality. And of course, when you do this, you want uh, you know the, the this transformation preserve meaningful properties of the data. So typically, what we'd like to do is to preserve neighborhood for the data points such that the neighbors, if they're neighbors on 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 on, on sort of in, in high dimensional space, they would also be neighbors in in, in low dimensional space. Now, the most naive dimensionality reduction would be literally throwing away you know dimension. So if you look at this, uh, at this, at this, uh, at this uh, figure, um, there are like two cylinders standing here, x, y, and z. And what I'm saying is like if we throw away z coordinate vertical axis, they will do look like circle. And if we throw away um, x coordinates, they will look like straight lines. So they'll change, but that sort of you you kind of moved from 3D to 2D. Now this particular example is actually not very helpful, right? Because you're kind of losing a lot of information about the object. And if we take this two-dimensional point cloud and just reduce it, like project it on single axis the way I showed it here, then you know all the points will align across along that axis. And you also lose a lot of information about the, the data structure here. But then what happens if you just sort of drop one of the axes? We can do better than that. 
And so that's what we're going to talk about. So um, number one, story is a principal component analysis. Um, this is probably the most popular technique in, in, in all the statistics and, and data analysis that allows us to, re, to reduce uh, dimensionality of the data. So if we look at um, the picture on the right um, with a bunch of points, let's say these are two-dimensional points, right? There are X1 and X2 coordinates. So we could think like on the previous slide about like reducing dimensionality by, um, you know, for example, dropping, dropping X2 and just leaving X1. Then uh, all the points will be represented with just one coordinates, one coordinate somewhere here, you know, each data points. And so we're going to lose a lot of information. So it's probably not the best way to do this. So the idea would be to find an axis. And in fact, you want to build, you know, projections. Uh, so you can have like one or, or maybe, you know, again, two axes here, uh, such a way that you maximize uh, the amount of information that you preserve by doing, you know, selecting um, that projection. And when you data is sort of scattered in a certain way, um, the most important information, the most inf the information that differs mostly is really along the large, the long, the, the biggest variance, along the axis of the largest variance. And here, vari right, variance is sort of, that's the variance here for our data points, and that's sort of the variance along a different direction, right? Um, if we can automatically detect those directions, we can say, okay, there's a small variance here. So pretty much it's, if we use some mean, mean value, right, along this new axis, then, um, you know, we're not, we're not gonna lose a lot of information about the points, but what we do want to preserve is the position of the points along this PC1 axis, right? Because that's important. That's where a lot of variance is. And so the idea would be to, so to find the axis that lies along the largest, um, the, along the, um, the, the direction of the largest variance. And then you can project points on that axis and keep this single value, I mean, keep this axis, right? And so instead of two coordinates, keep one coordinate, but the coordinate along this PC1 axis. So it, by doing so, you can actually go from any number of dimensions to, uh, to like any smaller number of dimensions. Let's say, for example, you have a table with, um, you know, one, two, three, four data points. And uh, let's say with coordinates x1, x2, x3, and x4, and you can reduce them to, you know, coordinates, say, you know, are called PC1, say, and PC2, right, to two different components. And we selected those components such a way that, you know, the, the first one will be along the maximum variance, and the second one will be along the next maximum variance. So what I just described is really the you know, fundamental of principle of or the PCA method of principal component analysis. So going a little bit more into details, what we can notice that by maximizing variance, so by the select by selecting the direction where there is a sort of the largest distance between points we actually do two things. So first of all, we're maximizing variance. But on the other hand, we're also minimizing what's so-called reconstruction error. So reconstruction error is the, fo is the following idea. When we, instead of points having two dimensions, replace them, uh, two coordinates, replace them with one coordinate, effectively what we do is we're projecting those points onto the, our new axis. Okay. So those black points being literally projected on this on, on the on the axis becoming this green point uh, blue points. So by doing so, we're losing some information about 
black points, right? We're losing sort of information, this distance we're losing. So this distance are residuals. And by selecting the uh, direction of the maximum variance, by doing so, we at the same time minimizing those residuals. So we're kind of selecting the axis, which has the smallest reconstruction error. So the smallest sort of mismatch in between the actual position of the point and the one uh, we, we sort of make when we do principal component analysis, when we project the data. So here the formula is just saying like, okay, you know, we want to minimize reconstruction error or what we want to maximize the variance. And the reason this is true is because if we have a data point, of course, by Pythagorean theorem, um, you know, there's just sum of squares. And uh, if this is initial variance, um, then we have, uh, of course, you know, we, we, you can see that by maximizing initial variance, it leads to finding the direction with the minimum uh, sort of lost information, lost variance. Now, I just mentioned an important point about reconstruction. So the, the idea of this, um, of the principal component analysis in some sense that this is a compression, but it is a lossy compression. Lossy compression means you're losing some information when you're compressing the data. Why are you compressing? Well, be, be, because if initially you had, let's say, for example, you know, two coordinates, after the PCA you have one coordinate, you have, you know, 10 coordinates, after the PCA you have, um, you know, two coordinates, five coordinates, whatever you decide. And so then, like with any compression scheme, you want to, to try to reconstruct the original information about the data point, right? So try to put it um, where it, it should belong to. And, you know, this reconstruction process, of course, carries some error. And the more components you keep, the, be the better you can reconstruct um, the original data point. And so what we see here is that, we, for example, keep um, uh, one component here. And we're trying to reconstruct the matrix um, and the matrix is, uh, again, this, these are data points and these are coordinates, right? And using some linear algebra, we can actually reconstruct it by doing this out of product in between um, the, the, the new principal axis and, um, you know, the, the projections on those. Or if you have three vectors, you have a better reconstruction. Or if you have like sort of full matrix here, then you'll have a perfect reconstruction. And the same way as in clustering, it's very hard to say what's the optimal number of projections you want to keep. And so again, this um, number of projections, number of components, again, we get the same type of sort of the elbow approach where you look at the, here is a sort of variance explained or, you know, the, the quality of the reconstruction versus number of components you use, which is number of components against number, it's a dimensionality of the space you project in, whether it's, you know, if you project on the one line, it's one component, on two lines, two components, on, on, on two axes, two components, et cetera, et cetera. So PCA method is, is again, it's very powerful, universal, very often used for visualization purposes. And so you project then on two axes, you have some high dimensional data, and you know you project it on two on on two axes. So you know example is here you have three dimensional uh, data points, right? Points in the three D, and you try to find the plane. When you project on the plane, the uh, reconstruction error will be smallest. But it also means that you know when you look at the plane, you kind of preserve the most information about the data, and sort of you'll be able to see better the patterns in the data. And so that is um, what you do um, with, with PCA. Now, moving along, um, life is not always that easy. And, uh, you know, the data is not always looking like, uh, you know, like, like, like this, right? It's not always nicely sort of shaped where you can 
select easily sort of direction of maximum variance and 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 you know that that, that will work out for you sometimes um data looks a bit strange um you know like an example is here I mean of course this is artificial example but this is an example um scientists using to test methods this is called a Swiss roll and so the idea is can we find a representation for that? It feels like you know it's in 3D, but in fact, it's just a two-dimensional object, right? So it's a two-dimensional. Think about the sheet of paper rolled this way. And so you would want an algorithm that actually would understand that this is in fact only two-dimensional objects, not three-dimensional. So the third sort of coordinate is extra. And then by taking X, Y, and Z coordinates coming up with a way to actually preserve only X and Y coordinates in some sense trying to you know create those axes the one we saw for in in pca but having them like one axis would go sort of around this role and the other one will go sort of perpendicular to this role and then if we can do this then um you know in on, on in those projections in those projections the picture the role would look like that right which would be pretty cool. Um, now, if you look at this and 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 think about, say, doing you know PCA, well, the maximum variance of the data is probably in this direction, so it's not going to do anything for you. It will just collapse all the data, all the data. So it's you know PCA it will not work well here. It will not work at all here. Or just say dropping one of the one of the axes will also collapse all the all the data down sort of we and, and, and duplicate the data you completely lose information about the structure so to do this to work with those non-trivial non-linear objects you need non-linear projection methods and so far we looked at what's called linear projections um, and that was principal component analysis you know subsampling with features which is sort of dropping some of, of some of the data I haven't mentioned this, but there also the idea of random projections, which is sort of randomly generating projection um, matrix, and the feature agglomeration. You can actually use clustering to group features together, and that will also be considered as a projecting them on a low dimensional space. So we go from more features to less features. But then there is this nonlinear projection world, and there are quite a few algorithms there, like local linear embedding, isomap, Laplacian eigenmax. I mean, MDS, uh, T-distributed stochastic neighbor embedding. This, all these methods, they're trying to build a sort of local structure and, and do something like principal component analysis, but locally. So like sort of literally on the small patches of data. And then that allows them to reconstruct the shape of, of, of the data, right? That's good, which is called manifold. Now, today there are, you know, very powerful methods, which is called autoencoders with a neural network that also can, can do a lot of stuff like that. Okay. So let me give you a couple more examples um, on this. Um, this is this S shape. Uh, it, it's slightly different. It's not a Swiss roll, Swiss roll. it says S shape. But it's also quite complex because, again, with simple sort of projections, or with, with, with the PCA projection will probably go, you know, uh, go go at the ending, at an angle here, uh, which doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, and, and just sort of projecting on one of the axes, it will also lose all the information about the, the S shape here. But this is what we get uh, when we do the methods uh, I mentioned the previous slides. So for example, this is Isomap, which actually did, does a pretty good job um, in TSNE, um, representing it. It's color coded such a way that we understand the sequence of um, you know the sequence of color is continuous here, and so we, we we're making sure that when we have a projection, the points that are close to each other in the original space will remain close. To each other in the project in the projection space and so that's does a pretty good job now um this is clearly very 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 artificial example right you, you know you you'll not have this s shape um, data in in the real world so why are we talking about it well the reason is because this approach this approach is extremely powerful for visualizing your data 
when you're doing uh, all kinds of uh, machine learning problems. And here is a classical machine learning problem where um, you're given um, a set of handwritten digits, right? And uh, each, digits, each digit here um, is, is an image and the image has 64 cells, right? 64 points. Um, so it's eight by eight, right? Eight pixels by eight pixels, so eight by eight, 64. Um, and so it's a, six, it's a vector of 64. And um, then, uh, you know, there are a couple thousand of them. And um, this is a very classical um, computer vision algorithm where you try by looking at this handwritten images that can be written, you know, slightly differently. You can actually classify them into 10 classes and assign each image to appropriate class, right? Zero, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, so that's the algorithm will do it. But the question is, each digit here, right? Digit zero represented by a vector of, you know, 64 values that corresponds to grayscale values um, on by um, eight by eight. Uh, grid where each number is 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 written, right? So you know it's it's not clear how to visualize this because you have you know a lot and a lot of those you know vectors of the length sixty four. These are our points, right? Sort of a vectors of points um, in the sixty four dimensional space. And what we what we're hoping for is is it possible would it be possible to find a two dimensional space such a way that uh, we will see uh, you know the, the, the so that, that that we will see the structure in this data and structure in the data really means you know it will position close to each other those digits those handwritten digits that are you know that corresponds to the same real digit. So, you know, when we're doing random projection, it's all mixed up. You cannot see anything. Um, when you do isomap, it's actually not that bad. Notice it projected all green points. Uh, green here, it's colored. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's labeled three, right? And here is another cluster. These are all six, so these are all fours. So that's actually pretty good. MDS, not bad. Um, PCA. Uh, you know the standard principal component is actually not doing too well right you see it's it's a it's a mess um, local linear embedding didn't work too well but the method ts and e actually very very works really really well notice that it managed to have all those projects all those points that corresponds to each of the classes um, separately and and so in some sense this method can be even used together with clustering so yes you can actually run clustering directly on the 64 um, dimensional space but you can also run this for example projection um, do T, T S and E projection and then run clustering on two-dimensional space and that it will discover for you um, all the clusters, all the sort of groups of, of, of points that correspond to the same digits, right? So you can use TSNE as a pre-processing step to change, literally to change the feature space, go from a lot of dimensions to a smaller dimension. And of course, you can use it for visualization. So the, 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 the sort of the trick, not the trick, but, you know, the rule of thumb here is that um, you typically try two things you typically try um where is it pca right because it's very easy and it always works and if you don't see anything on the pca you just try tsne because that one is probably the most powerful and will do the best job uh visualizing and i mean of course you can explore other methods but that's sort of what people usually do okay and i think with that we're done so we talked about segmentation today as a notion of uh, separating cluster, uh, customers in separate groups 
with the similar properties and those groups are clusters and so the technique uh, for segmentation is clustering and it's unsupervised learning so you actually only provide this, the number of clusters that you're looking for and then algorithm will find them for you plus we also talked about the way to visualize that data if you have high dimensional data you can project it on the low dimensions with principal component analysis and with um, uh, various manifold learning techniques and with that, we're done. Any questions? Thank you for the lecture. All right. Well, thank you very much, guys. Then we're done for today.